Life is an intelligence test. So begins a recent review of the genetics of intelligence. This test is mostly predetermined, according to the co-author Robert Plowman and his collaborators, in the sense that achievement in society is based on intelligence, which itself comes largely from heredity. Plowman is at the forefront of the burgeoning field of behavioral genetics, which seeks to find the sources of our traits, dispositions, mental illnesses, intelligence, achievement, basically all of that which differentiates us in our genes. They are, of course, not the first ones to engage in this quest. For 130 years, it has been perhaps one of the most contested claims in genetics. The heart of the conflict, however, has not so much been over the claim that heredity affects our characteristics. Everyone agrees to that on that statement to some extent. Rather, the conflict is more over how this claim should be understood and how it ought to affect our practical goals. In this paper, I would like to interrogate two terms from that initial quote of life as an intelligence test. The first being intelligence, the second being test, and how the particular meanings given to them by behavioral genetics might affect social practices. Test here is taken as predictive, indicating the future capacity of an individual. Though prospective in nature, this test is still tied to competition. Life in this model is a competitive struggle among individuals based on intelligence. Unlike market-centric theorists, though, behavioral geneticists want to use their tools to help make education a better preparation for this competition. In doing so, I will argue that this can have dangerous social consequences by focusing on success in a competitive culture, thus precluding richer goals for education. Moreover, such prospective testing can be used to eliminate those who will not be able to compete and subjecting others to intensive individual management. It thus mirrors darker past forms of eugenic policy. Intelligence is also defined in terms of tests, but it is framed in terms of metaphors of mind derived from computer science. Thinking is information processing by machines in our brain shaped by genetic blueprints. Yet, as I will argue, this cannot be an adequate picture of thought. It eschews the lived world filled with meaning and tacit knowledge. Behavioral genetics reads a contingent understanding of intelligence into biology, which will ultimately prevent an engagement with richer understandings of intelligence, such as those found in expert craft practice or ones relying on interpretive abilities. This behavioral genetics framework, therefore, leaves behavioral genetics reinforcing a deficient model of intelligence and society. Despite these problems, with new DNA sequence and computer processing power available, behavioral geneticists feel that they are on the cusp of proving their theories, enabling increased social intervention. It is thus essential to examine the presuppositions and projected implementation of this research program. But before beginning a deeper analysis of their vision of tests, I want to provide a bit of background on what these researchers are actually doing in terms of their continuity and distinction from older forms of genetics. The new genetics of behavior draws on a long history of twin and adoption studies that attempted to differentiate the effects of nature from nurture. Such studies examined the characteristics of twins separated at birth versus those raised in the same environment, fraternal versus identical twins, and biological versus adoptive siblings. From these studies, Researchers claim that most traits have a high degree of dependence on genetic factors rather than on factors of education and nurturance. Most importantly for this paper, they claim that about 50% of the variance in intelligence in a population is explained by heritable factors. Other factors, like environmental effects, are either induced by genetics, affectionate kids induce parental affection, or only transiently influential, or are so individual as to be impossible to study scientifically. So for example, your experience of that bully in third grade or in your inspiring fourth grade teacher. It's important to emphasize, though, that these researchers are examining a very constrained environment. Most of the subjects of these studies live in middle class households in Colorado, the UK, and Sweden. Researchers admit that situations of gross poverty or neglect will have large effects, and it is far from clear whether their findings are applicable to different social circumstances or groups. Be that as it may, with this estimate of heritability, these researchers have moved on to genetics, 
Over the last 10 years, geneticists have gathered large aggregations of DNA sequence linked to background information and health records. Such databases include the 500,000 people represented in the UK's biobank, or the millions of people who have sent their DNA to 23andMe. In general, these databases don't contain the entire genome sequence, but rather sequence hundreds of thousands of specific <coughs> sites in the genome that are different in a population. Right? So most of the DNA-based pairs in our genome are the same for, for everyone, but there's specific sites that are different between um, many individuals. These are called SNPs, or single nucleotide polymorphisms. Researchers can then run statistical tests to see how much each variant of a SNP is associated with a particular form of a trait. Is a certain gene variant associated with higher levels of intelligence? By integrating these data, researchers can gain the statistical power to determine how much each different gene variant found in a population contributes to the variance of any kind of trait. Such calculations give them predictive power. They can look at all of the tens of thousands of SNPs in the, an individual's genome, determine how closely correlated each of them is with the trait, add those correlations together, and end up with what is called a polygenic risk score, the relative probability of the person having a certain trait. Now, each SNP alone might predict at most 0.2% of the variance of a trait, but when added together, these can add up to much more. So one can start to predict something more like 7 to 10 percent of the variance with some traits. In the field of intelligence, this means the ability to suggest whether a particular individual is likely, at some level, to be high achieving or low achieving, whether someone is likely to have a reading disability or a mental illness. At least, that is the goal. Of course, these would not be deterministic predictions, but merely a suggestion of a propensity toward a certain trait. It is a statistic tied to a large population, so it has very little predictive power for any individual. And further, currently, the best study only predicts at most 7% of the variance in intelligence of a population. Really, it's somewhere between 3.6 and 6.8%, but the media reports 7%. Still, at the population level, such predictions could be useful for administrators, therapists, and educators, allowing for, in their words, precision education tailored to individual needs. It is a testing that estimates future capacities rather than past accomplishments. This new form of genetics of intelligence is very different from the functional genetics popular in the 1990s that was tied to pharmaceutical development. This former paradigm sought to find one or a small number of variants that caused a disease or a trait and use, then use that knowledge to fix that disease. For example, one might seek a mutation in a serotonin receptor that leads to depression and then develop a drug against it. Unfortunately, almost none of these kinds of mutations have been identified. Instead, traits are influenced by hundreds or thousands of variants that all have very small effects. It would be impossible to manipulate all of these variants, so researchers have turned from using genetics as a resource for developing biomedical therapies to using it as a predictive <clears throat> tool that can then guide social interventions. It is this promised social intervention that is the justification for this research, since the actual biological knowledge gained has largely been trivial, such as that genes involved in neural development are also involved in intelligence. I mean, this is things that everyone could predict from kind of common sense. But wait, you might ask yourself, haven't we heard many of these claims of connecting behavior to genetics before? Indeed, the debate over the genetic basis of intelligence and personality traits spans almost the last 150 years. So just in the early 2000s, there was evolutionary psychology, the idea that the genetically encoded tendencies of our Pleistocene ancestors on the savanna governed social problems like rape, divorce, or aggression. The 1990s saw The Bell Curve, a book that argued that racial and class differences in achievement were genetically determined and thus that the effectiveness of social programs in closing the achievement gap would be limited. The 1970s witnessed E.O. Wilson's sociobiology and Arthur Jensen's IQ research, the intellectual precursors to the ideas found in evolutionary psychology and the bell curve. The forebearer of all of these frameworks was the eugenics movement. Eugenicists sought genetic causes of unfitness of various sorts, 
things like pauperism, criminality, and feeble-mindedness. These researchers sought to test the population in regard to various characteristics, including intelligence tests for the entire draft population of World War I, and then intervened to prevent future social ills caused by so-called low-quality individuals. The criticisms of these positions have been largely consistent from the beginning. First, criti critics justly attack the science. Sampling methods are problematic. Traits are poorly defined. I mean, something obvious for things like pauperism or feeble-mindedness. The tests used are questionable. So ongoing criticism of the IQ test is a case in point. And the hypotheses lack the basic scientific characteristic of falsifiability. They are, in Stephen Jay Gould's words, just so stories of our, how, how our hunter-gatherer ancestors behaved. More importantly for my argument here are two further sets of criticisms aimed at the social effects of this kind of research. These studies could lead to devastating programs of discrimination against those deemed unfit, an identification frequently tied to categories of race or class. This danger was shown in its full horror in the eugenics movement, which led to exclusionary immigration policies, miscegenation laws, the enforced sterilization of somewhere around 70,000 US citizens, and ultimately the horrors of the Nazi regime. Secondly, and more subtly, such research could serve as an ideological justification of the socioeconomic status quo because one of its claims is that wealth and status run in families largely for genetic, meritocratic reasons. Tied to this, many critics point to the influence of a Hobbesian philosophical anthropology on this literature. Life is a war of all against all for reproductive success. Shaped by evolutionary narratives, society is seen as a competitive struggle among individuals modeled on competitive market relationships, something we talked about earlier today. This reinforces a problematic understanding of what it means to be human, ignoring important aspects of the social and cooperative nature of humanity, and reinforcing some of the most troubling aspects of our society. While acknowledging a debt to previous movements like sociobiology, though, behavioral geneticists claim that this time is different. First, they argue that the genetic tools they are using are much more powerful. Through biobanks, geneticists have massive samples with which to work, allowing them greater statistical power. Because of past controversies, their methods have also improved although I'm going to discuss some of the problems in the second half of the paper. Most of these scholars have also sought to temper perceived negative social effects. They, are, they seek non-coercive policy solutions to the problems that they identify, arguing that coercion would have little effect. Further, major researchers in this field avoid implicit or explicit racism. Plowman, for example, rarely brings up race in his discussion. Now, this could be a good sign in that he is not explicitly making claims about, for example, African-American intelligence as found in the bell curve controversy. Indeed, most genetic studies actually exclude people of non-European descent in order to make the statistical analysis easier and more powerful. However, while possibly preventing abuses, these trends lead to issues with the validity of these findings. If minorities are underrepresented, none of these genetic findings will apply to minority populations, which creates issues for the planned use of this research in practical policy. As one moves farther into the popular arena, though, one finds less restrained commentators, such as the former New York Times science journalist Nicholas Wade, who claimed in his book A Troublesome Inheritance that distinctive population frequencies of different gene variants among ancestral populations of Africa, Europe, East Asia, Austronesia, and the Americas translate into distinct racial groupings with different behavioral characteristics. Of course, this is a problematic claim. There have been mountains of books arguing that these kinds of racial categorizations are very arbitrary. Um, we can discuss this further, but I'm going to focus on a different problematic aspect of his claim here. It is telling these diverse genetic inheritance make certain social forms easier to implement. Thus, Wade claims that democracy has had trouble taking hold in Africa and the Middle East because of genetic distributions that favor tribalism in these groups. This, of course, ignores the effects of history, the troubles of nationalism in Europe, and the example of countries like Botswana with well-functioning de democracies. Wade applies this general racial model, model to intelligence as well. He sees Europeans and East Asians as being of especially high intelligence. In regard to China, he sees this as a result of tests, 
the selection process of their long-running systems of qualification exams for the imperial bureaucracy. Here we see a tie between intelligence and testing that will be repeated below. While mainstream behavioral geneticists tend to steer clear of such claims, they share a similar form of argument as, he, as Wade does in that genetic propensities are essential to shaping environment and thus culture. Here we see how this research could be used in a problematic manner. Furthermore, while there are no plans for coercive eugenic policies based on this research, there is already the possibility of using testing to select what kind of children should be born, discriminating based on who is most likely to succeed in the intelligence test of life. A company named Genomic Prediction offers testing that will provide polygenic risk scores for parents undergoing in vitro fertilization. They provide the risk score of a particular embryo for common health problems such as diabetes, cancer, or heart disease. One of their tests is a polygenic risk score for intelligence. Initially, the company would only tell parents if the embryo was likely to be at the lower end of the intelligence spectrum, but there's no reason that they could not provide more detailed predictions of IQ. Parents can then use the information to decide which embryos to implant. It is, as supporters argue, a liberal eugenics based in parents' free choice rather than coercive governmental policy, but it is eugenics nonetheless. Now, no reputable researcher thinks the technology is yet ready for deployment in this way, but this is clearly the direction in which it points. Life as an intelligence test begins even before pregnancy. Now, the third critique, the concern that the defense of a competitive picture of humanity supports the status quo, is more complicated. In fact, most behavioral geneticists want to use their findings to manipulate and improve upon society. They are Rawlsians, supporting fairly progressive political frameworks, rather than market purism, red in tooth and claw. In a Rawlsian perspective of justice as fairness, defined as a social order anyone would agree to if they did not know their social position beforehand, inborn privilege, like you would get from genetics, can justify income redistribution, amelioristic social programs to equalize outcomes. This is what Plowman argues for, income redistribution and a respect for all kinds of employment. Rather than laissez-faire policy, they suggest highly managerial interventions. What is interesting is the form these managerial interventions take. According to Plowman, intelligence determines one's success in getting higher levels of education, which determines success in the goal of higher income. These are the stakes of the test of life. Education serves to maximize human capital in order to help people succeed in this struggle, as we discussed right before lunch. Thus, the interventions they suggest will not reshape nor social norms. Instead, they provide a highly individualized form of intervention. The goal, as described in Catherine Asbury and Plowman's book for education, uh, specialist G is for genes, is to use individuals' genet genetic data to shape a personalized plan of education in order to increase her competitive ability and to slot her into the right pathway for her genes. The goal is not to find better forms of education that serves a whole class, but to pick, tailor the teaching to the individual child. In Plowman's vision, each child would have what he calls a key worker, with access to her genotype, allowing for a unique educational track suited to the child's genetic gifts. There would still be choice in the system, but choices would be shaped by expert genetic interpretation. Yet there are problems with this vision. Practically, as noted, the actual predictive powers of genetics is low. Even if one knows a person's risk scores, they will still land somewhere on a distribution of a trait. Thus, following genetic data will lead to frequent mistakes, even in the best case. Theoretically, there are questions as to whether this is the vision of education that we want. It includes other possibilities for education and other grounds for critique. As Ivan Illich worried, it could merely perpetuate an educational system that prepares children to be consumers and competitors managed by bureaucratic systems. Its immersion in the logic of its own culture fails in the face of Bourdieu's criticism of contemporary education as merely a credentialing system. There are also issues with the centralization of power and expert systems of prediction. For these reasons, behavioral genetics remains open to criticisms. The test continues to serve the role of prospective filter leading to discrimination or intensive management that perpetuates problematic as aspects of our current system. But beyond these general problems with the social effects of behavioral genetics, there are also issues with its specific understanding of intelligence. 
scientific research is only effective insofar as the object of study is properly defined, especially when dealing with the large-scale correlational research of genomics. Now, this problem of defining the exact trait is, is, runs throughout most of kind of psychological research using genetics, like so defining schizophrenia or autism is impossible. Intelligence is just as difficult to define. This is especially so because behavioral genetics continues to use a problem mo problematic model of mind based on the metaphor of a computer. As Steven Pinker describes, quote, intelligence is a form of information processing, and mental life can be explained in terms of information, computation, and feedback. Beliefs and memories are collections of information like facts in a database, end quote. In this vision, the functioning of the mental information processing program, rather the groups of programs, is shaped by the genes that construct the machinery of mind through the process of neurodevelopment. The genome provides a blueprint for the neural circuitry. There's many uh, books on this entitled Blueprint. Right? Genetic diversity means that different individuals will end up with slightly different brain machines and thus different propensities for action based on given data. It is this shaping function that makes genetics so important to behavioral geneticists. But as philosophers Hubert Dreyfus and John Searle argued in relationship to artificial intelligence, such information processing models fail to explain the data of consciousness, human experience, and human behavior. Such models have no place for a world in the phenomenological sense, which one engages as purposeful and which one interprets and finds meaning in. In our experience, we do not encounter reality as a discrete body of facts that we then build into a framework, but we meet it as a whole horizon of meaning through which we understand individual facts. These different models of mind perhaps explains why behavioral geneticists and their critics talk past one another. We can see how these distinct models of mind create different visions of the person in society when we look at how behavioral geneticists respond to critics like Stephen Jay Gould or Marshall Sollins which is clearly expressed in the title of Steven Pinker's popular book, The Blank Slate. Pinker takes his intellectual opponents to claim that the mind is indefinitely pliable, unaffected by internal mental structures. Critics are described by Pinker as either leftists embracing a Marxist philosophy of strict economic determinism, in which personality is completely shaped by social structure, or naive behaviorists, assuming that all behavior can be infinitely modified through psychological technique. Asbury and Plomet lament that, quote, the entire education system is predicated on the belief that children are blank slates. Environmental determinism has become the norm with all of the smugness and censure that it inevitably entails, end quote. Critics are taken as largely politically motivated because behavioral genetics would undermine the scientific basis for attempts at the social engineering of behavior, either through economic transformation or complex forms of Skinnerian operant conditioning. The blank slate, however, is an overstatement of the critic's position. Even B.F. Skinner recognized that behavioral conditioning was limited by the biology of the research subject. The scientist apparatus, quote, exerts a conspicuous control on the pigeon, but we must not overlook the control exerted by the pigeon. The behavior of the pigeon has determined the design of the apparatus and the procedures in which it is used, end quote. Behaviorism saw itself as an adjunct to evolutionary studies. Quote, the task of scientific analysis is to explain how the behavior of a person as a physical system is related to the conditions under which the human species evolved and the conditions under which the individual lives, end quote. Barry Schwartz has shown the parallel between the behaviorist and sociobiological understanding of the world as they interpret both in evolution and mental development through the framework of a competitive process of natural selection. For Schwartz, behaviorism serves as a psychological paradigm that best links sociobiology of the species to the economic analysis of individual rational action. The actual point of many of their critics, although not Skinner, of course, is that our dispositions, personalities, and drives are only expressed in a context that is already embedded in a world expressed through a cultural order, which is symbolic and interpretive. Kinship is perhaps the clearest example here, as Marshall so Solins showed. Whereas geneticists influenced by sociobiology would predict a strict focus on maximizing the fitness of closely related genetic kin, anthropologists have repeatedly pointed out that most systems of kinship do not follow a straightforward logic of genetic relationship. Those you regard as kin may primarily be identified by who one lives near, and only somewhat through genetic relatedness. 
Kinship may not even be understood as formed through birth, but through other processes. This becomes even clearer when affine kinship becomes involved, or in religious systems by which traditional kinship becomes reinscribed in new sets of relationships formed through ritual action. For example, in Christianity, the kinship of all believers as sons and daughters of God is initiated through the ritual of baptism. The difficulty that sociobiologist E.O. Wilson has in giving a convincing description of Mother Teresa's actions using his theory is noteworthy. As my respondent Howard Kay has pointed out in his book on the topic, to understand her altruism, Wilson is forced to embrace a concept, group selection, that he has already disproven elsewhere. The transformation of her interpretation of reality by a religious belief is perhaps a more likely explanation. The problem lies in behavioral geneticists' in inability to engage with the interpretive work of culture. In the behavioral genetics picture, culture is just a collection of facts. In Pinker, Pinker's words, quote, a pool of technological and social innovations that people accumulate to help them live their lives, not a collection of arbitrary roles and symbols, end quote. However, culture is better thought of as giving a conceptual framework that shapes experience, a paradigm through which one's engagement with the world is interpreted. This emphasis on interpretation, symbol, meaning, and analogy is nearly impossible for behavioral geneticists to come to grips with because of their model of mind. So based on this understanding of mind, the field assumes that intelligence is one general capability called the G-factor. This presupposition goes back to a 1904 paper by Charles Spearman. This assumption has been criticized for almost as long. Part of the problem with the either criticizing or defending the G-factor is that there is no theoretical definition of what it is. As one expert writes, quote, Specialists studying different manifestations of intelligence do not present anything like a united front on the meaning of the general factor, end quote. It is defined entirely in relation to intelligence tests. G is the general factor that explains correlations in performance on intelligence tests of whatever type. These intelligence tests only examine the most general problem-solving skills, things that can be tested in two minutes or one hour for anyone in the population. This is the conception of intelligence one might find emerging from a computational metaphor of mind. The G factor becomes something like computer processing power. Originally, Spearman thought of it exactly in these kinds of mechanical terms. He argued that, quote, G may be regarded as indicating a mental energy, whereas the variations of lower level mental operations represent so many engines into which this may be directed alter alternatively, end quote. So intelligence is power or energy that is directed into the individual machines of mind that carry out various mental operations. People just vary in how much of this energy they can generate. Defining intelligence as whatever the test measures has struck many as problematic. The claim that there is a common G factor underlying these is a non-falsifiable conclusion, since using advanced statistical methods, one can always find a co higher common factor among multiple factors. Stephen Jay Gould powerfully argued that the G factor is just a reification of a correlation. Though commitment to a single G factor is the dominant opinion in psychometric research, this kind of intelligence testing, there are many in the field who disagree. They point to the fact that this research has also identified many other intellectual skills that are not as general, <coughs> speed at problem solving, crystallized knowledge of the field, <coughs> verbal ability. Further, this model of intelligence does not engage many of the kinds of things that we think of in relation to intelligence in relation to intelligence, such as expertise. As two psychologists describe, quote, the expert is able to construct a framework within, within which to organize and effectively evaluate prevent, presented information, while novices with no expertise, based, no expertise basis for constructing a framework search for patterns and do reasoning by trial and error evaluations, inductive reasoning. So it's this expert kind of skill that we understand as mature intelligence rather than the skills tested by intelligence tests that are those that characterize nov novices in inductive reasoning. It is these kinds of expert skills that one would want to focus on in a model of mind that accepts the phenomenological world as the context of thought. This would allow us to appreciate other forms of intelligence, such as the forms of practical reason that Matt Crawford has shown in crafts like plumbing or carpentry. Ironically, as intelligence tests have moved to be less overtly discriminatory, they have become more deeply engaged in the computational model of intelligence. Early IQ tests were criticized because they seemed very culturally specific. 
For example, multiple choice questions given to World War I recruit, recruits asked about common products or entertainment stars of the day. In another variant that required test subjects to fill in what was missing in pictures, the questions required one to note what would be appropriate in a specific frame of cultural reference. For example, a picture of a house was missing something. The appropriate answer was a chimney. But Franz Boas, an early critic, told the tale of a Sicilian recruit who added a crucifix where it always appeared in his native land to a house without a chimney. An answer marked wrong. <laughs> Succeeding in the test was only possible from the perspective of some kind of cultural interpretive framework. Now, clearly, these tests were inappropriate. But the alternative has been to strip intelligence testing of reference to any, of it, to any cultural framework or interpretive ability, which holds its own dangers of encouraging a highly limited model of intelligence. So with the development of large genetic databases, even this kind of intelligence testing has become too cumbersome for the research enterprise. Intelligence tests tend to be long, and the best ones require specialized administration. With 500,000 or 1 million participants in the UK Biobank or the US All of Us program, sheer scale makes such focused, lengthy testing impossible. The intelligence test used for the UK's Biobank intake screening was only 13 questions long and time for two minutes. This is the basis for most of this research now. <laughs> Direct-to-consumer genetic testing companies like 2083andMe extract such information only through short, fun quizzes and questionnaires. There was a need then for a surrogate me measure for intelligence, which was found in educational attainment. Educational attainment is generally defined as the number of years of schooling, or sometimes the highest degree obtained. Studies have found that certain gene variants do tend to correlate with educational attainment with the most recent published study able to predict up to 3% of the variance of educational attainment in the population. That's not a lot, but as some commentators have noted, at the institutional level of who among tens of thousands of applicants to admit to college, it could make a difference. Interestingly, such polygenic risk scores based on educational attainment can be even more predictive for intelligence. The one I discussed predicts 4% of variance of intelligence versus 3% for educational attainment. This odd result makes sense once one understands that the definition of intelligence is based on those abilities that allow one to succeed in our educational establishment, such as test taking. Definitions and social structure are interrelated. Intelligence as success on intelligence tests correlates well with our educational system based in competitive achievement testing. So this inadequate definition of intelligence itself may lead to problematic, and policy, problematic policies. As geared toward an understanding of intelligence shaped by computer problem solving, it limits what education can be thought to achieve. It aims merely to give tools and maximize power and speed. Plowman thinks education should aim at two goals. First, providing a skill set consisting of reading, writing, math, and technological interaction. Second, providing skills that benefit the economy. Goals beyond these are fine, according to the him, but more like icing on the cake. These further goals should be chosen in consultation with the key worker to fit the child's genetic abilities and interests. <clears throat> Gone in this vision are any hope of a shared background provided by education, a shared set of knowledge foundations that all can bring to public discussion, creating a shared world. No longer can the focus be on developing interpretive abilities, narrative skills, or expertise. Its own dependence on testing and problem solving prevent behavioral genetics from engaging criticisms emerging from defenses of the liberal arts that are focused on testing grades and utilitarian skills, risk degrading the rich formation of the citizen that education once sought to be. As focused on individualized problem solving power, it removes all of the shared aspects of education. Education becomes heavily focused on technology, as one might expect from a computational model of mind. Gone are many classroom interactions as, by necessity, most of the teaching in this vision is provided by educational software. Teachers cannot be expected to personalize instruction for every student in a class, according to their genetic readout, so technology is necessary. Individualization thus drowns out, drowns out shared knowledge or even intersubjectivity. This also leads to the loss of other goals that education might have, like induction into a longer, line of uh, into a longer tradition of knowledge, or, en or engagement with other minds. Everything becomes tailored to this vision of optimized individual problem solving. Already, the goal is inherent in the presumptions of the research. 
So in conclusion, this paper has argued that there are many possible problems with contemporary behavioral genetics. The central ones, though, are that it misdescribes human experience through its definition of intelligence in terms of general problem-solving ability, framed in metaphors derived from computer science, and then also through its understanding of human society as fundamentally a competition between individuals. Its foundation in prospective testing can have dire consequences, with such systems of individual management attempting to shape children to a competitive society or eliminate before birth those who cannot compete. Educational initiatives based on this framework would aim, at, um, uh, would aim only at such success, precluding richer goals. These researchers assume the current order and cultural values, reading them into biology rather than seeing them as the historically contingent form of engaging in intellectual ability that they are. More deeply, the understanding of intelligence as problem-solving power precludes other concepts of inte intellectual ability. Intelligence is tied to testing, thus obviating the forms of genius that surround us in the practical, aesthetic, and contemplative life. In this way, intelligence research may prevent us from finding a path to what we most truly need as individuals in society, wisdom. Thank you.